Today from the Global Lane, the woman in this famous photo from the Las Vegas tragedy shares her story of hope and rescue. And it's right here, right now, from the Global Lane. More than a week after the Las Vegas shooting, we're still hearing stories of heartache, heroism, and hope. Sherry Sledden is from the San Diego area. Sherry, tell us what happened to you moments before that uh, now famous photo was taken. My friend and I had been at the concert for the three days, and um, right before that picture was taken, I had gone back inside. Um, we had gotten separated. She went to safety, and um, and I went back in. A girl had been shot right next to me in the calf, um, and I went back in to help and just kind of kept moving. There was off-duty police officers and Marines and everybody um, just lending a hand where they could. And afterwards, there was about 10 of us left. They got cleared by SWAT and they moved us to a vacant parking lot across the street. And um, we talked for a little while. Everybody wanted to go back in and, and even bring the people out that weren't moving anymore. Um, but they wouldn't let us. And in one second, I was fine. And the next second, I went into shock. Um, my whole body started shaking. I couldn't stop it. Um, and I think just the, the impact of everything, uh, hit me all at once. And that's when I sat down and, um, someone had asked me if I was okay, if I was injured, there was, um, a bandana that I had taken from one of the, the injured and it was covered in blood and I had put it on my arm and I didn't realize that it was still there until after someone asked me and, um, at that point, I took it off and was holding it, and that's that's when that photo was shot. Now, I understand uh, someone actually died in your arms. That's um, one of the people that I'm I'm desperate to find at this point. Um, the man with the bandana, um, he had shown up right behind me as I'd moved from one victim to the next, and he was laying on the ground, and I got down on my knees and his head was, I mean, his face was right next to mine. And I had had one hand on his face and, um, the man next to him, who I believe is his father. I don't remember how I found out that information, but, um, he said, I think I have my hand on his wound and I grabbed the bandana to use it, you know, for pressure. And I slid my hand under and my finger went right up into the hole in his back. Um, and with my other hand holding his face, I just said, can you feel that? And he said, yeah, I, I can feel it. And I said, that means you're alive. Um, but then his eyes just kept rolling back. And one second he was looking at me and the next he was limp. And we lifted him to put him on the, the cart. And I thought he was gone. Um, but I haven't seen him in the faces of those that have passed. So I just, I'm desperately trying to find out how he is. Sure, you, you want to find out if he made it and, and uh, if he's in the hospital or how he's doing. And, yeah. and I, there are others too, right? Um, yeah, the girl that I had um, initially gone back in for um, that was shot in the calf, um, I would never have, have turned and gone back in if it wasn't for her. And... Um, she was so grateful and she just kept asking my name and asking for me to spell it. Um, but everything was moving so fast. And before I knew it, she was on the cart and gone. Um, and I would just really love to give her a hug. Well, well, Sherry, how can they get a hold of you? I know you're searching for them because you want to want to connect with them. And I, and I know there's healing in that connection. How can they get a hold of you? Um, I'm, my face is kind of everywhere right now. Um, but I, I have an email address that I posted on survivor pages, um, that can be given out. Um, I, anything, anyway, I'd called the hospitals, um, and the directors there are trying to help. I gave them my cell phone number and everything to give to any victims that have those wounds, um, that, you know, I can connect with. I'm fielding tons of messages a day, but I just keep going through them, trying, trying to find anybody. So if anyone has any information, I'm more than happy to talk to them.
Well, of course, we also have your contact information, and if anyone wants to contact us, we can pass it on to them if, if they uh, want to uh, discuss it with you, maybe someone that you had, had helped. And I understand I that you returned to work this week. Now, I, some people would say, gee, that was just too soon after this tragedy. Why did you return right away, and how has it gone for you? Um, so I, I spent last week kind of trying to process everything. Um, I'm blessed enough that, you know, the people I work with, they covered my shifts last week without even second guessing it. Um, I work for a veterinary clinic in Marietta, Marietta Animal Hospital. And um, for about three days, I didn't get out of bed. I just, I have four kids and they came in and would spend time with me and I just wanted to love on them and and try to get through everything. Um, as you can imagine, with the picture being out there, I had a ton of information to try to process and people to try to reach back out to and thank. And um, but because I I felt myself kind of sinking into the gravity of everything, I needed to get back into a routine um, to get back up and keep moving, um, if not just for myself, but for my family. And what are you hoping will come out of this tragedy, not only for you and your family, but also the nation? Um, I'm hoping it'll help unify people. Um, it was the worst thing I've ever been through in my life, and it's the worst thing a lot of people have ever been through. But at the same time, I've, I've never seen such unity from so many people. Um, everybody just kind of turned and reacted and their gut reaction was to help those next to them, to stop and pick people up even while bullets are flying by them, um, to, to help in any way they can, take cars, taxi drivers were stopping to load victims into their car. Everybody came out the next day to, to donate blood and waited hours and hours because they just felt this desperate need to help. And I don't feel like enough of that is getting out there. Everyone's focusing on the darkness, on how evil this man was. And it's the evil of one man, but there was goodness in thousands of others. Um, God was there and, and he was watching over and trying his best to protect as many as he could. And I've talked to people that that turned away a long time ago from thinking about God and, and, and just said, you know what, now I'm back. Like they could feel his presence in everybody that was there helping. And I think that there's just not enough of that in our nation right now being seen. Everyone's um, focusing on the divide and, and not, not the good. Well, you know, there, there is an old saying that there are no atheists in foxholes especially when artillery is coming in. And I want to know, how has the experience affected your faith and you personally? Um, I've had a very, very difficult life, some would say. And um, I mean, just in the last five years, I, I almost died twice in labor. Um, my daughter came early and almost died in the NICU. My husband was diagnosed with cancer and we spent almost a year in the hospital. I mean, but through it all, people always, I, I heard this saying, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. But I don't see it that way. Each one of those times, God saw me through it. Things that should have taken me, should have taken my daughter, should have taken my husband, didn't. Um, and it's a story of hope. Um, and this is just one more example of that. Was it extremely difficult to understand how this could happen? Yeah. And especially in the middle of it, it was it was kind of like, here we go again. Um, but I could hear bullets flying past me. My best friend could hear the same thing, and yet neither one of us got hit. We didn't get injured. We, we were a few of the lucky ones and my faith is is that much stronger god has a reason and a purpose for everything and i'm hoping that my purpose is 
to help spread his love as opposed to spreading the hate and the fear. And, and I think you're doing that today just by sharing your story. And also you have four wonderful children. Beautiful. Uh, that need you. Children. Yeah. Sherry Sledden, our prayers are with you and with Thank the you. injured and with the families of the victims of this tragic mass shooting. We, we pray there thank will not be so another much. one like it, and, and we thank you for your strength, and may God be with you and all the others. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. A turkey court is sentenced a Wall Street Journal reporter to two years and one month in prison. The government argued Isla El Bayrock engaged in terrorist propaganda. Miss Isla was convicted in absentia. She's in New York. But it's another example of the Erdogan government cracking down on journalists and opposition in that country. Well, CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell joins us now with more from Jerusalem. Chris, what can you tell us about this journalist and why was she convicted by Turkey? Well, she was convicted, Gary, because she wrote an article actually more than two years ago about the PKK, which is a Kurdish group in eastern Turkey that is considered by Erdogan to be a terrorist organization. Now, she wrote a pretty straightforward article about what was happening there in uh, eastern Turkey, and yet they considered it, they meaning the Erdogan government, considered it uh, propaganda. It's just one more sign of the Erdogan government cracking down on the media. Many people may not know that Turkey has more journalists in prison than any other nation in the world, including China. So he cracks down on anything that stands against his government's position. Okay, Chris, what, what is he really trying to accomplish there by doing that? I think it's a chilling uh, reminder of what he's trying to do is uh, uh, just control all aspects of society. After the uh, attempted coup by, uh, that he accused uh, Fertuana Gulan about, uh, he's cracked down on the military, the judiciary, the, the journalists. Uh, he's just trying to control Turkey in all sorts of ways. So I think it's uh, one more reminder of uh, Erdogan trying to establish an authoritarian Islamist dictatorship there in Turkey. Well, how, how should the U.S. respond? Well, I think they should stand up against them. And I think that we, we know just in the last few days, there was a uh, U.S. consulate official who was arrested by the Turkish government. In turn, the, uh, the United States uh, shut down visas to Turkey, Turkish officials, which in turn, the uh, Turkish government shut down uh, visas for U.S. officials. So I think they need to stand up against Erdogan for eight years President Obama really kowtowed, I think, to the Erdogan government. But I think the Trump administration is taking a, a bit of a stand here, and I think they should continue to stand up against Erdogan. Chris, it does seem like there is a growing divide between Trump and Erdogan. Of course, a lot of people don't know Turkey is a NATO country. They're our partner. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, this growing divide, first on ISIS and Syria and the Kurds, now this, what do you think is happening? Where will this lead? Well, I think finally the Trump administration, like I said, is standing up against them. And one thing we need to remember, uh, Gary, is that there's a, there's a pastor, an American pastor, Andrew Brunson, that's in prison right now. And he's really become a political pawn using, used by Erdogan against the United States. He would like to try to uh, swap uh, Andrew Brunson for a man named Gulan, who's in Pennsylvania right now. And uh, Erdogan is accusing Gulan of trying to have a coup and overthrow his government. And I, I think this is, uh, he's using Brunson as a political pawn. Uh, people really need to be praying uh, for the release of this pastor who's been uh, uh, jailed unnecessarily, just as, uh, just as Erdogan is trying to use some sort of leverage against the United States. But I think the, uh, the U.S., hopefully the Trump administration will stand tall against, uh, against Erdogan. Human bargaining chips, right, Chris? Exactly. And, and we know that Erdogan recently made a trip to Iran he met with the Ayatollah and President Rouhani there. What was the significance of that visit? I think it's very significant, and part of it is because uh, you have to look at the Kurdish referendum just a few days ago on September 25th. We were up there in Erbil reporting on that, and the Kurdish uh, regional government in northern Iraq would, would like their independence. And uh, the concern that Turkey and Iran share about that is that they both have large Kurdish populations within their borders. Uh, there's about 30 million Kurds in the region, maybe about five or six mi million in, uh, in northern Iraq, but millions more in both Turkey and Iran. And they don't want to see an independent Kurdistan 
lest their own Kurdish populations try to become independent as well. So I think they're having a joint strategy uh, against this uh, idea of independence of the Kurdish people. The uh, Baghdad government has shut down the airport. I talked to a Kurdish official not too long ago that said they were doing military exercises uh, on the Turkish border. There were uh, Iranian tanks on the Iranian uh, Kurdish border. So they're trying to intimidate uh, the Kurds in northern Iraq, lest their own populations uh, try to get their own independence. Squeezing Barzani a little bit, I think, as well, uh, uh, because they see him as an ally of Israel. Exactly. And in fact, in the referendum, Israel was the only country really to come out for Kurdish independence. The Trump administration, I think, uh, tragically, really hasn't supported this idea of independence. They're, they're going with this one Iraq policy that Iraq shouldn't be divided in any way. But the Kurds really are a natural ally to the United States, to the West, and especially Israel. Israel has a really affinity with the Kurds. Many Kurdish Jews had to flee one time from Saddam Hussein. They ended up here in Israel. So uh, they would be one more ally here in the West if it could be an independent Kurdistan. And, and I'm sure Israel's very concerned and had a close eye on that meeting between the Ayatollah and Erdogan. For sure. And, I, you know, when I was up there in Kurdistan, Gary, there was a big concern that Iran was trying to get what they call the Shiite arc or crescent or corridor all the way from uh, Iran to the Mediterranean. We saw the increase of uh, presence of Shiite militias funded and armed by Iran up there in northern Iraq. And that's a concern that many people have, that once ISIS is finally defeated in that region, that Iran and these Shiite militias are going to fill the vacuum, posing one more threat, not only to Christians in the area, but the Kurds as well. Okay, Chris Mitchell, I'm sure you'll keep a close eye on it. We appreciate you being there to follow this, and I know you'll update us. Thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Gary. An alarming development affecting religious freedom in Pakistan. In the state of Punjab, a crackdown against house churches in the city of Bahawalpur. Eight pastors have been arrested. House churches have been closed down. And joining us with more from London is Wilson Chowdhury. He's with British Pakistani Christians. Wilson, what's happening now? Well, the eight pastors who have been arrested, who had been arrested, have now been set free after bail fines were paid. But they do await now a fuller court hearing, which we don't know which way it will go. Uh, the concern has arisen because a year ago, um, the district of Bahawalpur uh, decided on an ordinance, or they ratified an ordinance, uh, a bylaw, if, if that helps, uh, which now states that churches are, can no longer use PA systems if it's offensive to local Muslims. Any house churches uh, for you know those new up-and-coming uh, satellite churches that seem to be propping up in Pakistan as uh, there is this new wave of outreach. Uh, they've now been banned from having a a church uh, that's too near a Muslim home. A, a Muslim, you, a, you cannot build a, have a home church or, or a new build church within 100 metres of a Muslim home. And there are other restrictions. And this isn't unusual. A meeting of elders from the two communities, Christians and Muslims, would sit together over a meeting presided over by police and decide on the functions of a church, where certain towns and villages will have to have police presiding over the offence that's been uh, committed to Muslims who don't like the sound of worship from Christian churches, who do not like Jesus being spoken of on their streets. This could proliferate. Perhaps it could become provincial. Even worse, could it become part of national legislation? If so, then the government could, would clearly be seen as, uh, as being opposed to the very articles it ratified under Section 18 of the UN Convention for Human Rights. And how are Christians responding to it, Wilson? There's little they can do. Uh, as I said, these eight pastors have been arrested. They haven't stopped preaching the word. Mm -hmm. There'll be secret house churches, much like in places that, such as China and others. Uh, um, it, 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 churches will simply start to go underground more, especially if this law proliferates across the country. I mean, sh certainly for now, we have to ensure that people are praying across the globe that the national government perhaps gets involved in this. But we have a petition. People can sign that petition. We also need to fund the legal um, cases for these individuals. So we'll be hiring solicitors for the eight pastors. It would be wonderful if people could donate to that work. If they want to learn more, they can come go to our website at www.britishpakistanichristians.org. Okay, Wilson Chowdhury, British Pakistani Christians. 
As always, thank you for keeping us informed. Dr. Marilyn Singleton is an Association of American Physicians and Surgeons board member. And in her latest column, she writes about the social health of the nation, asking if we've lost our collective minds. She says the Las Vegas mass shooting with no apparent motive is, quote, an extreme representation of our sense that our social fabric is unraveling. She joins us via Skype to explain. Dr. Singleton, maybe Stephen Paddock lost his mind, but what makes you think that America's lost our collective minds? One of the things that I've been noticing over the years, and part of this comes from just years of seeing thousands of patients, whether at work in the hospital or at an outside clinic that I ran, that people just seem to be more disconnected. I'm not a psychologist. I can't say why, only my observations of, you look at people walking down the street, they're together, they each have their own cell phone out, busily texting others. Why are they walking down the street together if they're not talking with each other? No one seems to talk to each other anymore. You text some bizarre line of, of letters to someone and that's supposed to take the place of a conversation. And this just seems that we need some connectedness of one kind or another in order to keep our heads on straight and to ground us. And, and it doesn't seem like the mainstream media is helping matters any. And, and some members of the mainstream media and others every day react to President Trump. You also mentioned the reaction that Tim Tebow received for taking a knee in prayer, and then the response Colin Kaepernick received and other NFL players are getting for taking a knee in protest. Please explain. One of the things I think that this whole NFL taking a knee, having lived in Northern California and knowing the 49ers and how this whole thing all began, one, it's been changed to make it look like it's some holy procedure for these fellows to take a knee, when in reality, taking a knee ends the play and trying to say that, no, we don't want any part of this. We don't want any part of the flag. We're having a protest because Colin Kaepernick didn't get a job. And it's the idea that's just happened over the years, and even people who aren't very religious notice it, that it's okay to mock and make fun of people who want to show their Christian faith, but you, all bets are off if it's somebody else. What about millennials and what's happening on college campuses? You know, the violence and hatred that we've seen at Berkeley and other places in recent years, why now? One of the things that I believe has started this is it's so common and so many writers talk about this. If you don't have a good argument in a political conversation, the default method is to call someone a name. And the children in school are not being taught critical thinking. So they don't have an answer. Therefore, what do you do? Just like a child, you act out, whether it be violence or name calling, or trying to get people who do have their facts, trying, trying to quiet them. And there, and there are some bright spots, are there not, especially in the midst of a crisis like the one we just saw recently in Las Vegas? Oh, my goodness. People really step up to the plate. And this is one thing that's always made me so happy because we know that people really are good inside. People don't look at people with labels. And when a crisis occurs, all those labels are erased. And then once the crisis is over, the politicians get a hold of people again, and they label you this, you this, you this, and therefore you're not supposed to like each other, you're not supposed to talk to each other. But these crises have just brought out the best in everybody, and we just have to find a way to remind the people that when 
you were rescuing somebody, whether in the hurricane or during the horrible Las Vegas event, that you didn't care what color they were, you didn't care what political party they were, and we have to keep that mindset going. That's right. One America, Dr. Marilyn Singleton, we appreciate your insights and thanks for taking the time to set us straight. And now to drive it home. This past summer, American leftists demanded the tearing down of Confederate statues throughout the South. Some were defaced, others were forcibly removed. Now the left has another target, Christopher Columbus. The ultra-left group Antifa threatened to disrupt Columbus Day ceremonies and commit acts of violence. A statue in Providence, Rhode Island was splattered with red paint and defaced with several obscenities. Now listen to what one millennial, Jeffrey Branch, had to say about that. And the reality is there's so much blood and so much um, hate and imperialism in what he did. And so to see it actually reflected in the art of someone coming and, and painting blood on the statue, um, I th I f it feels very cathartic and good. So it's all about feelings. It feels cathartic and good. Well, what about the feelings of Italian Americans? What about the feelings of the majority of Americans who like Christopher Columbus and want to honor him? What about our feelings and our rights? Well, I doubt Mr. Branch and many people on the American left know the truth about Christopher Columbus. He was a devout Catholic who believed he was sailing to Asia to bring the gospel to the people. He also wanted to find and collect gold and other material wealth to help fund another crusade to liberate the Holy Land from Muslim occupiers. Now, the left will argue that he brought death and genocide to the indigenous people. Really? Columbus all by himself with his men genocide? True, many Native Americans died from European diseases, but so did many Europeans back in Europe. A tragedy, yes, because Columbus and others didn't realize that Native Americans weren't immune to European diseases. But genocide, no. And if not Columbus, some other European would have come and started America's first wave of European immigration. It was inevitable. Just like Neil Armstrong venturing into space and walking on the moon, expanding the footprint of humankind to other horizons, that's inevitable. Columbus changed the world, changed history by what he did. What will Antifa and others like them ever accomplish? Let's see, spray some paint, deface some statues, shout obscenities, beat some heads. Great guys. You're really great. You're going to change the world, right? Well, I have some advice for you. Why not try cracking some books, doing some research to learn the truth? Why not get a meaningful job? Seems like you have a lot of time on your hands to commit acts of thuggery. Why not build instead of tear down? Titus 3.14 tells us to devote ourselves to doing what is good in order to provide urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. Good advice. So let's keep our history, the good and the bad, and work to produce a better America. And let's focus in on what's really important. Well, that's it from the Global Lane this week. Until next week, be blessed.